our son. Where's Elijah? Okay. The risen Christ is with us, amen? Amen. amen. The right, this side's a little lopsided today. <laughs> Let's stand together as we give praise to God. and Christ is with us. Good morning and welcome to Memorial United Methodist Church. I'm Ron Beaton, one of the pastors. What a joy it is to be with you as we worship the risen Christ today. Today we're continuing our sermon series, Father Abraham and his many sons, and we're making it all the way to Joseph. We're getting close to the end of this um, this series, but it's good to have all of you. I want to extend a special welcome to any guest who is with us today. If you are a guest, we hope that you'll fill out a Connect card in the attendance pad as it gets passed down the row, um, or if there's not a Connect card in there, you can scan that 
QR code on the back of the bulletin, and that'll take you to a connect form online. But we're really glad you're joining us. I also want to welcome all of those who are joining us on our Facebook live stream or tuning in on YouTube a little bit later. We're glad you're worshiping with us as well. Let's pray together. Most holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the chance to worship you in spirit and in truth. As we hear the stories of the faith, we pray that you speak to us afresh, speak to us anew. Help us to know your son, Jesus Christ, more fully so that we may grow in knowledge of your grace and uh, conviction of your grace and then to go and share that love and grace with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing.
name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I misled you all last week. Um, today is not the last sermon of our sermon series, Father Abraham and His Many Sons, but it is the penultimate Sunday. Um, this Sunday and next Sunday we'll finish out our series with Jacob's favorite son, Joseph. Um, as we talked about before in the uh, book of Genesis, um, it's full of family dysfunction which means that if your family is dysfunctional, congratulations, you're in good company. Um, we are spending time with God's dysfunctional chosen family. The parents in his family keep, keep picking their favorite children. Brothers keep trying to kill one another. Men have children with multiple wives and their servants, leading to jealousy and chicanery. The world's first two brothers were Cain and Abel, and what happened? Cain killed Abel because he was envious of God's favor. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. These brothers didn't try to kill one another, but Abraham and Sarah, they cast out Ishmael and his mother, Hagar, leaving them for dead in the desert, only to survive because of God's mercy. Isaac had twin sons with Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau. Esau was Isaac's favorite. Um, Jacob, or Jacob was Rebekah's favorite. So Jacob manipulated his brother into giving him his inheritance for a bowl of red soup. And then he conspired with his mother to make sure that Isaac gave uh, Jacob the family blessing. Um, Esau then vowed to kill his brother. The two brothers end up making amends, but it's only after Jacob spends 20 years living in another country. Um, then we have the story of Jacob and his many kids, and my, oh my, 
Jacob fell in love with Rachel, but was tricked to marrying Rachel's older sister Leah, who was also the less attractive sister, and this, not surprisingly, created friction between Leah and Rachel, and Leah was excluded at first, but then Leah was able to have children, and Rachel wasn't, and that made things even more complicated. Jacob has two children with Rachel's servants, Bilah and two children with Leah's servants, Zilpah, which only make matters worse. Leah then has two more kids, and it was only after Jacob had fathered ten sons and one daughter that Rachel was able to have a child, and Rachel had two boys, and because Rachel was always Jacob's favorite, her oldest son, Jacob, was Jacob's, uh, her oldest son, Joseph, was Jacob's favorite. All right, clear as mud, right? Let me make it a little more clear for you in one sentence. Of Jacob's 13 children, 12 boys and one girl, Joseph was his favorite, and his brothers from another mother hated him for it. Right? (laughs) Make sense? Joseph's favorite kid's status was symbolized by a gift that Jacob had given him. Jacob, who had had a name change at this point to Israel from God, gave Joseph A coat of many colors. That's the way most of us know it, right? Uh, Maybe you're thinking Dolly Parton, I don't know. At least that's how the King James Version translates it, a coat of many colors. The New Revised Standard Version says it is a coat with long sleeves, as in a coat that would not be used for manual labor, right? Jacob was a mama's boy who loved to stay inside and dwell in his fancy tents, right? Maybe he wanted the same for his son Joseph, his favorite son. Robert Alter, who's a famed Old Testament scholar, translates it as, quote, an ornamented tunic, which makes me think that, like, the coat was something that Liberace would wear. Um, But the most famous translation, of course, is an amazing Technicolor dream coat. That's how Andrew Lloyd Webber translated translated it and how Donny Osmond pulled it off, right? So, however we translate it, the coat was a physical reminder to all of the other brothers that Joseph was the favorite and they were not. Insufferably, Joseph wore that coat everywhere. One night, Joseph has a dream. It was a different kind of dream than his father Jacob had in the desert. Remember that dream where the angels are ascending and descending a ladder and God's voice comes to him. But here there's no angels, there's no voice of God. Rather than a vision in a moment of deep REM sleep, Joseph's dream was more of a a daydream. Joseph's dream was all about Joseph. (laughs) He had a dream that he and his brothers were collecting wheat. They were bringing in the sheaves, right? But Joseph's sheave stood up. And then all the other bales of wheat came over and began to bow to Joseph's bale of wheat. And Joseph, the self-absorbed, spoiled little brat, blithely assumed that his brothers would want to hear about his dream. Of course, he told them about the dream, and they didn't like it too much. You think you're going to reign over us? And they hated him even more for it. But wouldn't you know it, Joseph had another dream. This time, Joseph said to his 11 brothers, I dreamed a dream that the moon and the sun and the 11 stars all bowed to me. The thing about Joseph's dream is they don't take a lot of interpretation, right? His second dream was even a bit too much for his father. His dad said, really? What is this dream? Are your mother and I and your brothers supposed to bow down to you? And no surprise, his brothers hated him even more. His fancy jacket and his big head were getting to be too much for his other 11 brothers. As my grandmother would say, Joseph had gotten too big for his britches. Sometimes, sometime later, the brothers are taking care of the sheep. No surprise, Joseph was inside um, enjoying the indoors. And Israel calls out to Joseph, Do me a favor, son. Please go check on your brothers, see how they're doing. Joseph obliges. He puts on his fashionable outerwear and he goes to his brothers. From a distance, his brothers see him with his obnoxious coat coming their way. 
and they begin to conspire with one another. Here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. And let's throw him into the pits. Yeah, I know. We'll throw him in the pit and we'll tell everybody that an animal killed him. Joseph had dreams of greatness, of grandeur. And his brothers intended to kill him and his pretentious dreams. To the brothers, Joseph's dream was a nightmare. The idea of this spoiled brat receiving the family inheritance and controlling the family's future was just too much. And so they decided they should kill him. This all seems excessive, doesn't it? All 11 brothers were going to kill him, except for Reuben, who's known for his fabulous sandwiches, said, maybe we shouldn't kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit without water. That way there's no blood on our hands. Reuben was secretly going to come back and take him out of the pit later, but the plan didn't go as Reuben had planned. When Joseph arrives, the brothers, they strip him of his pretty precious pretentious petticoat and they throw him in the pit. That's an alliteration. Um, An attempted murder can work up an appetite, right? So the brothers sit down and they grab a bite to eat when a caravan of Ishmaelites come along from Gilead with their camels and they come by and they see Judah and Judah sees the camel and he sees dollar signs. And he says, what profit? What profit is it if, if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and we won't have to lay a hand on him. He is our brother, after all, our own flesh. And so they sell him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and the Ishmaelites take him then off to Egypt. Now, if you know the scriptures well, you know that Joseph's seemingly dashed dreams are far from over. His future is actually just beginning. But in that moment, this daydreamer has a wake-up call. Dreams are a strange thing, right? Now, I, I don't claim to understand the psychology of dreams, the role of dreams, but daydreaming, that's something that I know a little bit about. I spend a lot of time doing it. Sometimes I daydream, and they're selfish dreams, daydreaming about what life is going to look like in retirement, how much golf I'm going to play, what kind of experiences I might enjoy. Sometimes my daydreams are more altruistic than that how the world could be a more beautiful and just place? How might the poor find hope and the weak find strength? Sometimes my daydreams are kind of a combination of both, of the selfish and the altruistic, dreaming about what the world might look like someday for my children and my children's children. My daydreams are almost always positive, right? I rarely spend time ruminating on how the world's going to hell in the handbasket. Rather, I dream about the future and what could be. I wonder what your dreams are. I wonder how your family feels about your dreams, if you even dare to tell them what your dreams are. I wonder how they would respond I think about my dreams for this congregation, right? I dream about a church that's going to grow in faith and hope and love. I dream of a church, a people that offer hospitality to the stranger and hope to the downtrodden and comfort to the mourning and peace to those who know violence. I dream of a church that seeks a balance in their faith, that seeks to love God and neighbor perfectly through acts of worship and devotion and acts of justice and compassion. I dream of a church where unlikely friends follow Jesus together. That's my dream for us. I wonder what your dream might be. Certainly when we talk about dreams, right, we think about that famous dream, the dream that we heard of 60 years ago this month, the one delivered on August 28th. 1963 from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial a black Baptist preacher stood up and at the conclusion of a speech somebody prompted him tell him about your dream Martin and he did and he daydreamed for the whole world to hear I have a dream that one day the red hills of Georgia Sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream 
that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places shall be made plain, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. What a dream. It was personal and hopeful and altruistic and genuine. It was a dream of what could be, a dream of what should be. When you dream, you don't have to worry about naivete or impossibilities because it's a dream, right? But as our scriptures remind us, dreams are far from innocuous. They can be dangerous. They can be life-threatening even. The Reverend Dr. King dared to tell his brothers and sisters about his dream, even though it certainly would make him enemies. Not everyone understood that dream. Not everyone understands that dream. Not everyone understands dreams. Not everyone can handle dreams. Not everyone wants our dreams to come true. His dreams challenged the status quo, and the dream led to his death. Beware of what you dream for. The good dreams can get you in trouble, like they did for Joseph. Dreaming is dangerous business. Even taking the risk to dream when you know that the dream can't come true, it's still dangerous. Jiminy Cricket famously saying, when you wish upon a star, dreams really do come true. I wouldn't count on it. Dreams are dashed all the time, right? Hope and visions of things working out like you planned are crushed all the time. Finances dry up, relationships break down, families malfunction, disaster strikes. I always think of the song from Les Miserables, I Dreamed a Dream, in which Fontaine dreams of a beautiful future with love and hope, but then faces the reality that dreams for the poor and the oppressed are often torn apart. But the tigers come at night, she sings, with their voices soft as thunder, as they tear your hope apart, as they turn your dreams to shame. Life has killed the dream I dream. I think of the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the humble. That's who the kingdom of God belongs to. That's God's dream. Seems to, seems like a dream, doesn't it? A dream that disrupts the status quo. A dream that life seems to try to kill all the time. But isn't that the beauty of Jesus? With the resurrection of Jesus comes the resurrection of dreams and hope. And that's what we as Christians are about, resurrecting dreams for the poor and the oppressed, loving the unlovable. Joseph dared to dream about his future, and it nearly cost him his life. Of course, Joseph's dream, like MLK's dream, it lives on. We'll hear more about that next week. When the dreamer Joseph began to dream, there was no mention of it being a God-induced dream. And the dream seemed so self-serving. But what we'll discover is that with God, dreams are transformed all the time. There are some Christians who spend a lot of time saying things like, God is in control. And the focus then is on the sovereignty of God, which is not a bad thing. But when I read scripture, especially Genesis, what I discover is that God's more concerned with relationships than being in control. Joseph will rise to power through his ability to interpret dreams of all things. And because of this God-given gift, Joseph prepares an entire nation for a long period of famine. And it turns out, God was at work, quietly, subtly, in the background the whole time. God worked in the background so that the outcomes would be just so. What if it's not that God is in control, but rather God participates with us in our daily life to align our dreams with his. And maybe, 
That's a part of what we do on Sunday morning. We come to God with our selfish dreams, our dreams of grandeur and greatness, and then we worship the God who set aside his greatness to be with us in our lowly state, and then died our death, and we worship this God not only who died, but then rose to redeem all of creation and gives us hope that dreams really do come true. Amen. This uh, yesterday was a pretty special day in the life of the church. Um, so as a Methodist preacher, I don't, I don't get a lot of opportunities to do river baptisms, um, but I did yesterday. Um, so Evan and Lane and Cole Adams um, were baptized yesterday at the river um, out at Lesterville, and um, Tiffany joined the church. And so today, um, I'm going to ask you all some questions, um, because um, I want you all to support, know that you all will be supporting them, um, and especially um, these new baptized individuals as they grow in their faith. Um, and uh, also today we'll be celebrating communion, because in baptism you become a part of the body of Christ. And But what better way than to receive the body of Christ, um, to show that we're all at one in ministry with one another. Um, so, I'm going to read something to you. I think it's going to be on the screen. Uh, let me turn it here. So, I'm going to ask, members of the household of God, I commend Evan and Lane and Cole and Tiffany to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. So, let's read this next bit together. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you and the body of Christ, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to its ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. May the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Welcome. Christ, yeah, we can clap for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. If that's you, you're invited to this table, not our table, but the Lord's table. Um, so together, let us um, seek God's mercy and grace together. Let's pray. Most gracious God, um, we're a part of a dysfunctional world with dysfunctional families. Um, our dreams are often on ourselves rather than on you. Forgive us when we have not loved as we should. When we've done things we should have shouldn't have done, haven't done the things we should have. Forgive us when we have failed to love properly. And forgive us so that we might be free to love as you love. Free to be a part of your work, participating in your redemption. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer our tithes and offerings to God. As we do, you can give in one of three ways. You can give in the offering plate. You can text your offering to the number on the screen, or you can go to our website, memorialumc.church. Let's give of ourselves to God. Let's stand as we sing. Deeper than 
The Lord be with you. <clears throat> also with you. If you're able, please remain standing for the great thanksgiving. Let's lift our hearts up to God. For it is good and a right and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Joseph, you redeemed his dreams and brought salvation to a people who would be hungry. And so with all those who have gone before us with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we join together in singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, recovering of sight to the blind, release to the captives. By your Spirit, you fed the hungry, you ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he gave thanks to you. And he gave it to his disciples, or broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you. And he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Till Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And all of God's people shouted, Amen. Amen. And now with boldness we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite those who are assisting me to come forward at this time. We have our new (coughs) baptized gentleman coming up to serve communion with us today. This bread that we break, the sharing in the body of Christ, this cup over which we give thanks, it's a sharing in the blood of Christ. Just a reminder, in the Methodist church, we have an open table. That means regardless of what Christian tradition you come from, this is not our table, but the Lord's, and the Lord invites to his table all who love him. So I hope that that's you, and I hope you'll Come forward. Give 
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds a victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. We sing to the 
God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, 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 we shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Oh, 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 we shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. As Chris gets a microphone to tell us the announcements, I want to take a moment to say that I am now um, one year closer till death do us part. Today, <laughs> I am celebrating 12 years of marriage with my wife. Um, yeah. So I got her a dozen donuts in the back of the church. <laughs> uh, a few announcements as we sent you out this week. First is a reminder that it is Mission Week, so if you signed up for anything, uh, you should be getting a reminder email from Sign Up Genius, but uh, if for some reason you don't, just a reminder that it's happening this week. We look forward to seeing you all out there serving in various ministries. And then on the 22nd, which is a week from this Tuesday, we're going to be having a fundraiser night for our missions work at Panera. So 40% of uh, all the proceeds from that day will go towards our mission work. You'll have to either bring in a flyer, which are down at the Welcome Center by the Sanctuary, or uh, show that on your phone. So the emails we've been sending out have that link in there as well. Um, you can show that. Uh, and from 4 to 8 p.m. on that Tuesday, which is the first day of school here in Farmington, um, you can sh show up, drive through, show them the code, and they'll get that. Or... You can use the app all day and just put the code in as a promo code and we'll get credit for that. So we look forward to uh, having you do that. And then finally, uh, just a reminder that in two weeks we have our backpack blessing. Uh, and then in this service we'll have our promotion Sunday with the Bibles and moving all the kids up a grade officially in our ministries. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Go forth in this place, 1015, one hour on the dot. Go forth in this place. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. go in peace. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and 
we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out.